Good to see everyone here this evening. If you'll take your New Testament and turn to Revelation 16, that's where we're at. If you're visiting with us tonight, we're glad to have you, and we invite you to study along with us. We looked at uh, the first nine verses of this chapter uh, in our study last time as these bowls of wrath are being unleashed against this evil Roman Empire. God is judging it for its wickedness, and we get this sevenfold picture of judgment on the enemy and victory of the people of God. And uh, follows a pretty familiar pattern by now, but one, of course, that John wants to impress upon us rather profoundly, so we are seeing these images uh, repeatedly. And so we come now to the fifth angel in verse 10, and uh, the pouring out of the fifth bowl of wrath. It says, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened, and they gnawed their tongues because of pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. Uh, you recall that there was in the fourth bowl that the wrath was poured out on the sun, and it became intensified, and it burned men with its scorching heat, and here we have kind of the opposite extreme of that, that the lights go out. And of course, immediately we would be caused to think about the ninth plague on Egypt, the plague of darkness, where God put the Egyptians in the dark for three days. And you may recall from uh, other studies you've done in the Old Testament that God wasn't just affecting the daylight. The sun was one of the gods of Egypt. As a matter of fact, it was, in a sense, the god of the Egyptians. The god that is called Re or Atum was believed to be uh, the ruling deity of the Egyptian nation, and the pharaoh was believed to be the son of this god, the son of Re. Well, we have the kind of, that kind of thing going on here in the book of Revelation in the first century AD and Christianity versus the emperor cult. We have noted before that uh, the Roman emperors like to associate themselves with the god Apollo. And among other things, Apollo was the sun god. I've shown you uh, illustrations before that Nero had a statue of himself in the form of Apollo made outside of his house. He is depicted as Apollo on coins. And even Augustus has the things that are associated with Apollo on his imagery, like the, uh, the laurel wreaths and things like that. And so this reference uh, to the sun and then the sun being darkened is certainly kind of a jab at this ancient culture, and I think the ancients would have seen that rather quickly. And it is like we have seen before, God showing these people who the real God is. Or perhaps even better, the Son of God, it is the Lord Jesus who is unleashing these judgments, showing people who the real Son of God is. It's not the emperor, it's Jesus. It says here that uh, his bowl was poured out on the throne of the beast. And of course, a throne is a symbol of the seat of a government's or a kingdom's power. Uh, there was a reference back in one of the letters to the seven churches where the Lord said, I know your deeds that you dwell where Satan's throne is. And we uh, suggested that there might be a couple different ways to understand that. I don't believe that there is a particular location in mind here, uh, a particular city or anything like that. It is simply that God is attacking the supposed power of this false god, showing it to be nothing, that it is not a god of the sun at all, but God can take it out and turn it off anytime he wants. And again, this is not some kind of historical thing that we ought to go looking for in the history books. Was there an eclipse of the sun or something like that? Now, this is figurative language for God afflicting these people in some obvious way. And whatever it was, uh, these people have proven themselves over and over again to be beyond repentance. Verse 11, they did not repent of their deeds. 
We have noted that the method of God is to send warnings, judgments to get people's attention, to cause them to repent. And if they won't repent, he destroys them. And so nobody could say that God didn't give these people a chance. He gave them opportunity every step of the way to repent. Just like Pharaoh in the story of the Exodus could have stopped it any time that he wanted to by giving in to God's demands. Well, this wicked empire could have put a, a halt to all of this at any moment, but they chose not to. They blasphemed the God of heaven and therefore did not repent. Then we read uh, the sixth bowl, uh, which is one of the more perhaps intriguing, if not controversial subjects, not necessarily because it is any more difficult than any of the other symbols, but because this has become kind of the focal point of a lot of modern day speculation. You may have uh, heard of or even seen some premillennial type presentations of things in which it is declared that Jesus is going to come back to the earth and set up his kingdom in Jerusalem, in Israel. And at some point, depends on who you're talking to, before, during the middle or after uh, of all of this, there's going to be a great war called the Great Tribulation. And in that Great Tribulation, at some point, is going to be this thing called the Battle of Armageddon. Well, this is the text that they go to, and so we want to look at that uh, carefully, uh, because this is probably one of those texts that we'll have an opportunity to discuss with other people at some point. But it is uh, the sixth bowl in the series, and it begins in verse 12. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates. Uh, that is the normal way of describing the Euphrates River in the Old Testament. Sometimes it is called the Great River. Sometimes it is simply called the River. But everybody in the ancient world knew, especially Jews, that the Euphrates was the northern border of Israel. That it was the border between Israel and what came to be her fiercest enemies, the Assyrians and the Babylonians. And given all the Babylon imagery in the book, uh, the Babylonian side of that surely must come to the fore. That here we have the, uh, the natural boundary protecting this ancient place. And not only was it a division between Israel and Babylon, but you may or may not know that the city of Babylon itself in ancient times, before New Testament times, was built on the Euphrates River. And it was uh, uh, built in such a way that the river afforded it protection. We'll look at that in just a moment. But it says here that its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. And again, there's all kinds of echoes of Old Testament things here that John expects us to hear. Having the water dried up certainly would remind us of the drying up of the, the Red Sea is what I'm trying to say, as God delivered his people and destroyed the enemy at the same time. There is going to be deliverance uh, reported to us in verses 17 through 21, the great city falling apart and uh, God's people being victorious. And here perhaps the imagery is designed not so much to talk about the idea of God's people being saved, but their enemy being destroyed. Uh, Jeremiah uses language like this, and like just about everything else in the book, John is alluding to some Old Testament passages. And so in Jeremiah 50, verses 35 and 38, Jeremiah calls for a sword against the Chaldeans, declares the Lord, and against the inhabitants of Babylon and against her officials and her wise men, a drought on her waters, and they will be dried up, for it is a land of idols, and they are mad over fearsome idols. Well, a Christian reading that in the first century would have said that sounds a lot like the Rome of my day, a land full of idols, and not just classic idols, but men, the Roman emperors, worshipped in the form of images as idols as well. In Jeremiah 51, verses 35 and following, May the violence done to me and to my flesh be upon Babylon, the inhabitant of Zion will say. 
And may my blood be upon the inhabitants of Chaldea, Jerusalem will say. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I'm going to plead your case in exact full vengeance for you, and I will dry up her sea and make her fountain dry. Uh, this is a diagram showing the layout of the ancient city of Babylon. And the river not only ran through the city, but it was diverted and formed a moat all the way around the city. There was a sense in which the city, protect, or the city was protected by the Euphrates River. And so when God says, I'm going to dry up her waters, people in ancient times would have understood that God was going to tear down the defenses of this ancient city. And with the defenses gone, the enemy could cross and destroy it. Well, that's the picture that we get here as well, that God is going to dry up its water so that the kings from the east, again, another figurative uh, description here, might be able to make its way in. Um, as far as the kings of the east are concerned, uh, I don't think that, again, this is a particular army. I think it used to be kind of in vogue in studies of the book of Revelation to identify the Parthians with the, ki the uh, kings from the east. There really isn't any evidence, though, that the Romans were afraid of the Parthians or that the Parthians constituted some kind of major threat to the Roman Empire. And uh, I think that that kind of uh, historical reading of the text has pretty much gone its way. Rather, I think uh, something else is going on here. Uh, of course, we have the Exodus imagery going on. Drying up these seas and these waters, again, reminds us of the Red Sea, where God is acting as the redeemer of his people to destroy the enemy. And it is not without significance that that should lie in the background. Uh, the defeat of the Egyptians at the Red Sea, the drying up of the Red Sea for the deliverance of God's people, is remembered as kind of the model of God fighting for his people in the Old Testament. And very often, biblical authors, when they want to talk about victory like Isaiah does, uh, will go back to that scene as the way to describe what God does. And so there's some of that here as well, a lot of that here as well as I, I think. Uh, and these kings from the east uh, are, again, probably not a reference to the Parthians, but probably simply means that this is God's army. And that's not a particular human army that God is using. We might think of how God used the... Uh, Persians to destroy the Babylonians or use the Babylonians to destroy the people of Judah. But I don't think that's what's going on here. I don't think it's a particular historical army that John is trying to put his finger on, but that it is simply God's power that is unleashed, like an army. And the, the clue is perhaps that it comes from the east, which is the direction from which things from God comes. Uh, we have this kind of language in other places in Exodus 14. Moses stretched out his hand. The Lord swept back the sea by a strong east wind. And so the power of God coming from the east is what uh, divides the waters. And in Isaiah 41, who has aroused one from the east, whom he calls in righteousness to his feet. He delivers up nations before him and subdues kings. And in Isaiah 46 and verse 11, there, I think there's another reference there to God and the east that might be pertinent here. Bringing the bird of prey swooping down on his people to, uh, to punish them, uh, again, coming from the east, and that it would be from God's doing. Uh, and so we expect now... Uh, to see a great army. And there is really no other uh, mention of this army except perhaps the hint in verse 16. Uh, we do, however, get a different image kind of suddenly in verses 13 and 14. I saw coming up out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. 
Notice the three things that are mentioned there. The dragon, we saw him back in chapter uh, 12. Uh, He is in chapter 12 in verse 3 and 4. And then there is the beast, which is the first beast of Revelation 13, the beast which came up out of the sea. And then there is the false prophet, and the false prophet is what we saw in Revelation chapter 13, the second beast, or the beast that came up out of the earth. And that further reinforces what we suggested about it. We suggested, remember, that the first beast is the Roman Empire, the second beast is the emperor cult. Well, here he is called the false prophet. And so that, again, suggests that maybe that identification might be on target. Uh, But be that as it may, this unholy trinity, as it were, Satan, his beast, and its false prophet, are now gathering together in some uh, cosmic scene here, and from their mouth comes three unclean spirits. Of course, the word unclean is very often used in the Old Testament of Babylon. It is one of the characteristic uh, condemnations of that city. And the idea here is that behind the false gods are demonic powers. And that's not just, I think, a figure of speech. Uh, There's a little bit more to that, it seems to me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in what is an otherwise, I think, difficult passage, Paul says in verse 20, I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Well, there's that same kind of picture, it seems, here. That worshiping an idol was not just an exercise in vanity or futility or maybe even stupidity. We remember Isaiah saying that idols are nothing. Paul says that as well. But what they represent is something that is opposed to God. Idols represented the very things that the Bible says are evil forces that are against God. And it's in that sense, I think, that Paul says that the things that the Gentiles sacrifice to their gods, they are sacrificing to demons. The things that they call gods are evil beings. And you get that kind of thing going on here as well, that uh, behind these false gods are demonic powers. Verse 14, they are spirits of demons. And so we see their true nature here. It may be that some of the early Christians thought, you know, what's the big deal? We have seen warnings in the letters in chapters 2 and 3 to be faithful. And we heard about the Jezebel who teaches my uh, children to commit acts of fornication. We suggested that there was some kind of compromise being taught. And it may be that some of these early Christians thought, you know, what's the big deal if I acknowledge the emperor? He's not a god to me. And if I worship him and and burn a pinch of incense, I haven't done anything wrong because he's not a god anyway. And John says, well, it's not, not quite so innocent. That what that all represents is something that is opposed to God. It's your enemy. And therefore, you need to be aware of that. Uh... It's interesting that they are spirits like frogs. Uh, There is the Egyptian plague of frogs. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, if you read some of the the judgments of the rabbis in ancient times, not necessarily recommending that you do that. It can be a pretty boring thing to do. But in their opinion, there's nothing dirtier than a frog. You want to think about the most unclean animal possible, frogs are always on that list. 
And it seems to me that that might be the point here as well. Just the dirtiest thing, dirtiest symbol that John could come up with, a frog. We might not think of frogs that way, but that's what they are. Well, it turns out, verse 14, that uh, these demonic forces are part of this conflagration that is causing this great conflict. It says in verse 14, they perform signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for war against the great day of God, the Almighty. I think we have here again a reference to the spread of the emperor cult. That these demonic forces come up out of this religion-centered empire one of which the main pillars was this thing called the false prophet or the emperor cult, the commune of Asia that administered it. And they perform signs which go out to the kings of the whole world, trying to spread this message of Roman supremacy and how godlike the Roman emperor is and trying to, to get everybody to acknowledge that. And of course that's blasphemous. And the purpose of this is to get as many converts as it were as possible against God and his son, who is the true God and Jesus, the true son of God, to destroy their kingdom. The earth has become a battlefield. And the question is, whose kingdom is going to be left standing in the end? The kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus? Or is it going to be the kingdom of Rome, the false god, the false god who is the emperor worshipped as a god? Who's going to control this earth? Who's going to win? That's the picture that is kind of painted here. And so they go about stirring up rebellion for the war of the great day of God. Now, a lot has been made about that expression, the great day of God, as if it were a particular day on a calendar. But that's not what the expression suggests. Uh, the day of the Lord is a fairly common expression in the Old Testament, and it means simply the time when God chooses to judge something, to destroy something. And so we hear about the day of the Lord coming to Babylon, or the day of the Lord coming to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And it's not a particular day, like we think of a day on a calendar, but it's simply God says the time has come. Day in that generic kind of sense. Um, one scholar has put it this way, um, the day of Yahweh was not viewed in the pre-exilic and exilic areas of Israel's history as a singular, universal, or exclusively future event of world judgment. Rather, the day of the Lord was a powerful concept available to the prophets for their use in interpreting various momentous events. So just about, you know, just, uh, lots of things could be the day of the Lord, a day of judgment, a day of uh, catastrophic events, a day of reversal, um, he goes on to say that the day of the Lord is a concept that is used to interpret momentous events of war, and the day of the Lord will be fulfilled in the day of the Son of Man. The holy war of, of God is transformed into the war of Christ as King of Kings. The wrath of the Lord manifests itself as the wrath of the Lamb. And that's the way that this imagery is being used here. It is simply language of the Old Testament in which God says, that's it. I'm going to destroy it. The day has come. The time has come. I've had it. We're not going to take any more. And God is going to do it. And the picture that seems to develop in verse 14 is that this rival kingdom knows this. They are gathering as many adherents as they can for the war. They know that this is a showdown. The dragon, Satan, knows what he's doing, that he is actively opposing the kingdom of God, and he wants as many on his side as he possibly can. The deception that recruits the allies to join the war actually, however, becomes an invitation to their own destruction. And if you're listening very carefully to this text, 
you will hear an echo of Psalm 2. Psalm 2 and verse 2. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed one, saying, let us cast off their fetters from us, and so forth. Remember how that psalm goes. And the psalm is not talking about perhaps a particular war, but it's the kind of thing that happens over and over in history when men don't want to obey God, when kingdoms decide they're going to ignore the righteousness of God and, and want to do their own thing. And this kind of scenario plays out here in this messianic psalm. And remember the response is that God who is in the heavens laughs or scoffs at them. And he says, as for me, I have, a, I have a put my anointed one in Zion. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And I've given you a rod of iron, and you will crush the nations like earthenware, and so forth. That's that psalm. And so when we hear that these kings of the world are gathering together in opposition, we can't help but think of Psalm 2 and say to ourselves, I know how this is going to end. And there is really a sense in which Psalm 2 is about this conflict. Now, it's not exhausted in the great conflict with Rome, but Rome was perhaps the greatest opposition that the church faced. And it kind of reached its climax. The opposition reached its climax, in a sense, in the first century and, and, and what happened afterwards. And uh, I think that there's an unmistakable echo, therefore, of this. And if we're listening, we will catch a glimpse of uh, maybe the victory that is to come. So here we are, these forces gathering together. We're expecting to see a war, but there is no description of the war. Um, notice, if you will, uh, in verse 14, that God is called the Almighty. They are gathered for war for the great day of God, the Almighty. That is a phrase in the Greek that translates an Old Testament phrase, Lord of hosts. And what a host is, of course, is an army. God has an army. He has a spiritual army. He has spiritual forces in the heavenly places. Once in a while in the Old Testament, you even get a glimpse of them. Uh, the picture seems to be in the Old Testament that at least on some occasions that when Israel was fighting an enemy on a battlefield that there were invisible spiritual beings on the battlefield fighting with them. And you say, you might say, no, that doesn't sound right. But you remember uh, before uh, Joshua attacked the city of Jericho. You remember that strange scene that happened before that? That Joshua saw a man standing in the distance, fully armored with a sword in his hand, and Joshua went out to see him, to talk to him. He thought, well, maybe this is an enemy scout or something like that. And Joshua came up to him and said, are you for us or are you against us? And does anybody remember what the man or the being said to Joshua? He said, I am the captain of the host of the Lord. And what he was there to tell Joshua is that God's army is here. You can't see us, but we're going to fight for you. And he had come to encourage Joshua in the city, in the siege of Jericho. There's another place where you see that. You remember the time when Elijah was at uh, Dothan, if I'm remembering the place correctly? And the Syrians had the place surrounded because every time the Syrians wanted to attack Israel, Elijah would tell the, Israeli, the Israelite army where the enemy was, and they could never get him. And so they decided to capture Elijah. They surrounded the city. Elijah's servant wakes up one morning and says, Oh, master, you better come out here. The, the Syrians have surrounded the city, and we are in trouble deep. And... Elijah prayed to God. He said, Lord, open his eyes. And the boy's eyes were open, the text says, and he saw all around 
the army of the Lord, the chariots of the army of the Lord. There was a, an army there that was going to destroy this rival army. Now, I say that because God is here called the God of hosts. He has an army. And if you're going to ask me, does that army still walk the earth today and is it involved in battles today? The, question, the answer is, I don't know. But God used that army in the Bible to destroy enemies. He is regularly, for that reason, referred to the God of hosts or the Lord of hosts. And that is the picture that is conjured up here, that God's got an army too. Satan is recruiting an army. God's got one too. And he will lead it against these uh, forces. Uh, in the Greek of uh, the book of Revelation here, the word almighty translates a Greek word, pantokrator, which means all-powerful or almighty. And interestingly enough, there is a form of that word that the Roman emperors used. You can see part of it in this inscription here. This would have been A-U-T-O. K-R-A-T-O-R, autokrator, which means the one who is self-powerful, who has power all by himself or of himself. And there certainly is kind of a, a swipe at the Roman emperor by using this title for God here. It's, it's the kind of thing that a reader in the first century certainly would have seen and said, I know what that's about. So here they are, they're gathered together for war. The next thing we expect to see is a description of a battle. Well, before we get that, we get another one of these beatitudes. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked when men will not see his shame. Again, this is addressed to believers. The language uh, that is used here is language of judgment uh, in Isaiah, you may recall, and in Jeremiah as well. God uses this language of what he was going to do to his people, that he was going to strip them naked and take them captive into Babylon in that shameful condition. He was going to embarrass them thoroughly, hold them up as a people who have been thoroughly defeated and, and held up for public ridicule. And God is using that language here in a warning to his own people. Don't give up what you've got. Don't give up your faith. Losing your clothing, as it were. Because that's what's going to save you. And if you give up your faith, and if you compromise with the enemy and, and involve yourself in this wickedness, then you will be the one that is ridiculed and ultimately defeated along with this enemy. And so just like we've seen before, there is this warning. I think we saw one back in uh, chapter 14, uh, something similar to that as well. All right then, uh, we're still expecting a battle. And in verse 16, they gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Har Magadan. And this may be the most abused verse in the book of Revelation uh, by modern uh, students of the book. Har Magedon is actually a Hebrew phrase. Har is the word for mountain. Meg Magedon is the Hebrew word for Megiddo. And so it simply means Mount Megiddo or the mountain of Megiddo, which literally means the mountain of slaughter. Now, the thing is, there is no such place in the world. There is no mountain anywhere in Palestine that is the mountain of Megiddo. I'll show you a picture of the place in just a moment, and you'll see what I mean. It is rather a symbolic place. Please go to Zechariah 12. The morning will be like that in the plain of Megiddo. So by the time of Zechariah, the place is already kind of a proverbial place of great destruction and therefore mourning. Uh, in Joel 3, look in verse 2, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, 
and I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my inheritance, Israel, whom they've scattered among the nations, and they have divided up my land. And so uh, the Valley of Jehoshaphat, or anybody here know what Jehoshaphat means? Know the, name, the meaning of that name? God judges, God condemns. The Valley of God's Judgment. And so it is kind of like one of these places. Uh, it's not a spot on a map. It's a symbolic term for God destroying his people. Why Megiddo? Well, because it was a famous place of battle. It is where some important battles were fought in the Old Testament. Uh, you may recall that King Josiah dies at Megiddo, trying to stop the Egyptians from going through the land. Uh, but uh, there are other battles fought here as well throughout the Bible. Uh, this is what's there. The high little hill here with the buildings on top of it is the city of Megiddo. And this picture is taken from Mount uh, Carmel. And you look out here, and there's just this big plain or valley. It's called the Valley of, uh, sometimes called the, the Valley of Jezreel down at the south end. It is the plain of Esdralon, uh, known by a couple names. But you can see there's no mountain here. Uh, way, way in the background you can see the hills of Judea. The closest thing to a mountain would be way over here off the right. Mount Tabor stands back over there. But there is no mountain at the site of Megiddo. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, this has become kind of the scene of the big, you know, World War 1000 uh, in premillennial thinking. I think some estimates have several million Russians and Chinese soldiers gathered in this area right here. Uh, in some kind of big battle against the United States or something like that. I, I don't even keep up with all of the, uh, the interpretations. But somebody once uh, figured out, I think, that to get all the people into this valley that uh, some modern people say are going to be there, they would have to stand on each other's shoulders three, three tall. <laughs> so um, it's not literal. It's just a place where uh, great and catastrophic decisive battles were won by the Lord against his enemies and uh, or, or battles were fought and that's what we get here as well. The battle of course is not physical but is moral in nature. It's not an earthly battle that is being described here but a spiritual battle, a battle of loyalty between God and Satan and it is initiated by those evil forces. We're going to see this further elaborated in chapter 17, 18, and 19 as we get into the last part of the book here, which thoroughly describes the evil of this place, this Babylon, what is exactly so wicked about it, and how hostile it is. It really is, in a sense, the culmination of the conflict that began in Genesis chapter 3, when Satan turned God's creature against God. And he has been trying to do that ever since Genesis chapter 3, and this was his chance to really do it. We've said before, and we will say again, that really the greatest test of the Lord's church had to come in the first century. If this was going to be a kingdom to outdo all other kingdoms, that had to be tested and proven, and Satan had the mechanism to do that testing in the first century with the Roman Empire. And Satan, the picture we have painted of our study of the book is that Satan has now recruited the Roman Empire and its blasphemous emperor cult in an attempt to destroy the kingdom that has been established by Jesus Christ. And so it is a divine war of retribution that is unleashed here. We would expect to hear about the battle, but we don't. 
which is, I think, interesting because you'll hear a lot in television and radio today about the Battle of Armageddon and what's going to happen, and the Bible doesn't describe it. There is no Battle of Armageddon in the book of Revelation. We see the armies gathered together, and the next thing we see is verse 17, that a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it's all over. You don't even have to describe the battle. There's no point to describe the battle because God wins it. It doesn't matter how they fight. God wins it. And so remember the purpose of the book to encourage these Christians who are caught up in the middle of this struggle. They don't need to be told, here's what's going to happen to you next week or here's what's going to happen to you next year. They need to be told the outcome. And that's what John does. The seven angel pours out his bowl. We hear this loud voice, which is typical of divine pronouncements. God, the voice coming out of the temple of God saying, it's over. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. There was a great earthquake such as there had never been before. Uh, uh, so mighty, the great city was split into uh, three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. So the great city would be the wicked city. Babylon is its code name, but Rome is what is in view here. And God destroys it. Now, again, this is not something that we need to go looking through the history books for was there a time when a third of the city was captured by an enemy and then another third? That's not what it means. It means that God breaks its power. He, he, he divides it up. He, he splits it so that it can't be strong. And all of the cities that are its allies, they fall as well. The cities of the nations. Note that, cities. Because it is cities that are the expressions of man's pride and arrogance. And so all of this opposition to God is done away with. Babylon the Great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his uh, fierce wrath. And when it says there that it was remembered, it doesn't mean that God had forgotten, but that now God is dealing with it just like he said he would. Every island fled away, the mountains were not found. This picture that everything in nature is trying to get out of God's way as he unleashes his destructive wrath. That even the islands go running for cover and the mountains scurry off to avoid this great uh, uh, catastrophe. It's as if the world is coming apart. And we get that kind of language in Isaiah chapter 2, Jeremiah chapter 4. I don't think we have time this evening to read those. Huge hailstones finally in verse 21, about 100 pounds each come down from heaven upon men, and men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, because its plague was extremely severe. And again, we're reminded of what God did to the Egyptians, but also remember in Joshua 10 that as they were fleeing from Israel, as they were at the descent of Beth Horon, the Lord threw large stones from heaven on them as far as Ezekiel, and they died. God fighting for his people from the sky. No way to get away from what God is doing uh, in destruction of this enemy. All right, uh, thanks again for your good attention. As always, we will begin chapter 17 next time.